so we have uh, Mohammed with us. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so hi, Mohammed. How are you? Can you hear us? Mm, I guess the speaker. Uh, just check your mic. Uh, Hello. We, yeah, uh, we can hear you now. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, for in inviting me uh, for this talk. You know, I was uh, looking forward to it, and uh, mm -hmm. it's awesome. I, you know, before we get started, I just want to do some housekeeping. <clears throat> so, is my is my sound fine? Ah, uh, yes, it's perfectly fine. It, uh, because you know, I was uh, you know, uh, my camera is not you know functional, so you will see I, I won't mm -hmm. be uh, putting uh, you know using that. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, in the settings, I was looking at the uh, I put the high resolution audio also on, mm -hmm. so I was wondering if it was it's not like jerking or stuttering or anything like that, right? No, it's completely fine, like uh, crystal clear. Okay, I, better than my voice actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. I'm just using a high a high gain uh, condenser mic, so you might hear yeah. some, uh, you know, sound in the background. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, I, I'm going I'm I'm going to share my screen with yeah. the press. So I'm just doing that now, and let me know when you can see it. I know there's some issue with the. Uh, where is it? Moment. Okay, so I click on the share button. A window here share. So first, tell me if you can see the screen. Oh, uh, yes. Now we can see it. Okay. So great. Okay. So, um, you know, you're the uh, maestro here. So let me know when I can get started. Yeah, perfect. So Arnim, I guess we can just uh, keep ourselves uh, backstage and let the stage for uh, Muhammad. So over to you and keep rocking. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, also, um, uh, so I want to start by saying thanks to you know the, your team for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak, and you know to the viewers who are here, uh, to the listeners, you know on this uh, Saturday, which is a day for the loved ones. Uh, so I thank you for sitting uh, for this talk. So I'm basically going to be talking about you know setting up a smart contract testing environment in the cloud, and I'll focus on one particular tool. So you might be thinking in your mind, okay, why am I doing it this way? Why, why, why don't I just talk about Slither? So, uh, you know, the way I approach this is the problems which I faced, right? So my system is, you know, an old i5 HP running on 8, gig, 8 gigabytes of RAM and has an NVIDIA, which is like one, one gigabyte, right? And I use it for my own development stuff and this and that. And, you know, it, it's, it's problematic. So I was always on the lookout for a uh, some sort of a cloud kind of a development environment and in my study and research of it uh you know i came across gitpod which i'll be talking about okay so let me just take a step back so a uh, quick uh, uh so uh, first of all you know this is what we're going to be going over as you can see there's a lot of stuff it just looks like a lot because you know this uh, this collateral will, will be shared so i wanted to like pack it with the, uh, with information basically in a nutshell we'll talk about uh, Slither in general, just one moment, my mic is sort of not, uh... right, okay, so uh, we'll talk specifically about Gitpod, pros, pros and cons, and then we'll talk about Slither. Uh, okay, so uh, moving forward, so just a quick uh, brief overview about myself, so my name is Muhammad X, or I call him Muhammad, um, my background is basically I'm an R&D guy, I used to work for, you know, the American government once upon a time, pre-pandemic, Post that some things changed as you know that the pandemic was a life-altering event for everybody and i sort of got into the web3 area so while exploring the web3 area uh you know i got interested in it and then i hopefully wanted to do some you know make my own thing uh so you know you, you see this is why i put myself down as the founder of the startup i have two startups which i'm sort of trying to look at one is called block finney other one's called block.games i'm also a gamer you know, Call of Duty and Valorant and more Mortal Kombat, you know, I'm from that background. So, you know, I wanted to do something in that area. Also, you know, information security in general is, you know, like, a, I wouldn't say passion. You know, I just view the whole thing as a game. It's something I used to do. I used to do some web to, bu uh, you know, bug hunting specifically, you know, in the uh, famous uh, bug bounty hunting platforms such as... Uh, 
Hack the Box, uh, sorry, not Hack the Box, like Hacker One and Bug Crowd. Of course, I've not got any P5s yet. I got some P1s and P2s, yay. And so, you you know, taking that momentum of, you know, my interest in security from the Web2 side, I got interested in Web3. And then I slowly started investigating the Web3 security aspect. You know, they, when, when you read about these hacks, it's really jaw-dropping, right? I mean, if it was me lo- losing that kind of money, I, I would be financially ruined. So basically, you know, those were sort of the, you know, motivators for me to sort of get into this area. And I sort of stumbled upon this community called Immun- Immunify. And, you know, these guys are really great. I mean, there's some good people there. You know, Adrian Hetman was here and... Uh, there's a bunch of others also, and I met not hacktivists, and then who introduced me to Razor Sex. So, I mean, it's it's a quite a vibrant community with people who want to really help each other. Uh, also, you know, uh, to the to the uh, moderator, you know, if I'm speaking too fast, just say yo, man, just slow down, all right? Uh, okay, uh, moving forward. So, uh, uh, what, the way I've designed uh, designed this is that you know, there's going to be just a quick bunch of slides, and then I also have a workbook. Okay, I just changed my screen. Can you can, did you can you see the screen change? Hello. Oh yeah, your screen is clearly visible. Okay, so you, you, the screen has changed changed right to this unchained thing, which is there on uh, which is this hack MD workbook, right? right? Yes, yes, you can see it. Okay, so I'll be shifting back and forth. So I, I've I've come back. So okay, so let's uh, dive right into it. So we'll be talking about Gitpod. Gitpod is basically a cloud development environment, and then we're going to talk about Slido, which is a st- uh, Solidity Static Analyzer. So Static Analyzer meaning that it analyzes code which is already deployed or you know sitting on your machine and it's not changing. It's not dynamic in nature. This is why it's called a Static Analyzer, right? So uh, so let's let's now talk about why would somebody want to even bother with a cloud development environment. So as I pointed out in, in the beginning was that, you know, if people might have certain constraints, you know, their uh, computing process and the CPU power constraints, then, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll always keep uh, complaining. And, you know, the cloud development environment always it seems like a better option. Now, in the cloud development environment space, you have, you know, a famous ones, which is AWS Cloud9. But as you know, AWS tends to become a little bit pricey. So I've used it, you know, for doing some amount of, of, of development work. I'm not a coder as a background. I'm more of an experimenter. I like to experiment with stuff, you know, look at code and, and see how it functions and see how I can find a weakness in it. And then you also have REPL.IT. REPL.IT, as you know, is another famous cloud development environment, but that's not used so much in production. And it's mostly for, for, for testing. So in my search, I came across Gitpod. So Gitpod, you know, as you can see, it has a free tier, which is really good. And, I, I, and, and uh, you know, we'll be doing, I'll be showing an actual demo of all of this stuff. So you guys can hang on. So the most important reason why would anybody want to use is this particular reason. Now, if you're a Python developer, for example, you know, you have to keep uh, setting up a Python virtual environment. You might forget, you might not forget. Every package is different, you know, and you have to keep doing this for every new project you work on. Then you have the NPM. NPM also, uh, they tends to have conflict errors, right? You have to keep changing them. So, I mean, having a cloud environment, uh, fixes all of this. Of course, there's a security component to this also. Uh, you know, so far, Gitpod, you know, has not have had uh, any major data leaks of especially their authorization tokens because the way it works is that it is sort of, you know, you open your Gitpod repository or a GitLab repository in it. And the way it functions is that it does its authentication by the uh, GitHub uh, auth uh, token function. So, so far, you know, nothing has been wrong with it and it's actually being used in, in, in production. So I will, I will show that. The other important thing is that, you know, uh, these are some cons. Of course, you know, there's no solution which is perfect. You can see you can't install some stuff and, you know, there's an idle timeout, especially if you're on the free tier. Uh, you have to restart. Whenever you restart the instance, you know, you have to keep, uh, you know, installing the packages. But that is also... Uh, fixed by this thing called pre pre builds, which I will you know get into it uh, a little bit later. If you have any questions, just you know put it into the chat, and I'll attend to them by the end of the talk. I'm I'm timing myself, so I'll I'll make sure I keep some time for that. Okay, so let's so uh, when you start installing Slither, uh, you know Slither requires a bunch of dependencies. You can see over here. Let me just uh, maximize this image a little bit. 
so these are the dependencies hopefully you know you can see my screen with the image so you know you need the solidity compiler and then you need this old c selector so the way how slither works is that you know uh, you know, when you do the analysis of your Solidity file, often they tend to have different versions, uh, you know, of the compiler, which is called the Pragma compiler uh, declaration. So you use SolC to actually change uh, between them. So you need Solidity, uh, the SolC compiler, you need the SolC select. Of course, you need hard hat because, you know, Slither works by using hard hats libraries also. So, and you know, hard hat is a Solidity, Solidity development environment. Uh, what I also do is I also install uh, Truffle because Truffle is also similar to Hard Hat. For some reason, you know, when you have unexplained errors, instead of diving through the, you know, going through all of the uh, JavaScript uh, configuration files, this often solves the problem. I know that sounds funny, but you know, this is my experience. And then finally, you install Slither. Slither can be installed in one of two ways. You have the Docker image, which you can pull from their official repo source. But when you pull it down, the problem is that it's not the latest one, right? So then you will have to go through the trouble of manually, you know, uh, upgrading all of the package package within it and then you know if, if you want that state you'll have to sort of recompose your own docker file so but the benefit of that is you don't have to go through this whole installation and you know it, it you know dot, this is the great thing about docker files like it's it's like a complete contained unit of everything you need you just start it and plug and play right and then of course uh, uh, slither is a an official uh, pip uh, python package you use the pip3 command to actually run the run the install so that's the that's the workflow and then okay so um so the yaml what is this well, yaml thing so as i mentioned gitpod uh, since it is a, a cloud development environment the way it works is that you know you you open up an instance when you open up the instance and then you know you start uh, you know installing stuff in it right <laughs> for example if i want to run just one moment if you want to uh, install Slither, you'll have to do all the things that I asked. But the benefit is that they have this thing called a, a pre-build and a startup sort of functionality via a YAML file. What that means is that you know you you put all that stuff in it there, all the declarations. Every time you restart your instant instance, it gets you know downloaded and installed, and a whole bunch of tasks which you can automate to just you know get started right away. Uh, okay, so then before we that, so now the whole purpose of this this conversation about Git Pod and Slither, like why are we bothering with this stuff, right? Is because you know we want to use it for security. This is of course prior to me, you know, there have been some excellent talks uh, regarding this topic, and post my talk also, there's going to be a lot of people talking about it. But this is just sort of a snapshot of you know the whole security threats DeFi uh, the, uh, the security threats in the DeFi space, right? So this diagram is taken from a paper. You know, once you get my uh, uh, this particular deck, you will see at the end, you know, I put all the references down so you don't have to worry about that. So uh, this is basically what the landscape looks like. So all blockchains, you know, have these components. You have the uh, DeFi protocol, which can be attacked, the smart contract, the EVM, and the internet. Now, these these can be interchanged for the chain chain which you're working for. So the threat stack is these are the types of of, of, of the attacks. You have protocol attacks, you have market market attacks, and you know you can see a bunch of these things, right? And of course, then you have the attack techniques. We all know about the flash loan, which happens all the time. Signature exploit was, you know. I've, they could have been uh, done some. I'm not sure. I've not read a lot of these uh, uh, postmortems. I'm I'm sort of catching up. You know, I'm sort of new in this area. And then of course you you have these bunch of other uh, integer overflow and underflow. Just recently, uh, there was one uh, uh, one token which got uh, exploited because of this particular uh, exploit, right? And reentrancy, reentrancy. You must have heard about this so many times. Right. Apparently, it's 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 a very common kind of a, uh, a vulnerability. Even though it's talked about so much, it still exists. So then the question comes in your mind: Okay, man, if everybody knows this stuff, why are these, ha you know, why are similar hacks happening over and over again? Well, the answer is quite simple: because a vast majority of the projects are just forks of existing projects. So, you know, a Razor, uh, RazorSec, for example, comes up with their Razor token. Most probably it will be an ERC-20 token and they most most probably could have forked it from somebody else, you know, and as a base, of course, and then built on top of it. But what happens is a lot of these projects and then somebody, a third party like myself, would then fork RazorSec's 
token and then try to you know build my own stuff on it now the problem is that in the pursuit of gaining finance uh, gaining funds as you know because the web3 is a is a very hot space and when you say web3 to a uh, or blockchain to any investor he starts literally salivating right so so they just want to grab it quickly so they just fork these chains they don't do any code auditing because who wants to spend money on that in the end it's about you know just getting our token out getting the tvl in and then we'll figure all this stuff out right so that's just you know my my opinion on that particular matter Okay, and then this is just a quick, you know, these are the top 10 attacks, you know, taken from where, again, I've referenced, this is from Consensus, you know, they have this uh, uh, good repository called uh, Consensus, uh, uh, you know, uh, top 10 vulner vulnerability attacks, the links are all there in my in, in my deck, and uh, out of them, these are the, the most common ones, so you have the re-entrancy, I put the three exclamation marks to indicate that you know this happens all the time you can see it, it's 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 because of an external contract uh, takes over the control flow you have front running which is you know faster transactions by monitoring the mempool for profitable transactions an interesting note about front running which you must have heard you know uh, in the nft space front running is a big deal so and you know a lot of the for example whenever they have a, a new nft drop if you hear some guy suddenly has bought all of the NFTs, you know, in a matter of seconds, how did this happen, right? They use these things called, uh, you know, uh, MEV bots, right? Flash bots, they're called. So these flash bots are these automated bots that actually run transactions. But how do they work? Like, how do they actually work? So in the Ethereum chain, very quickly, whenever a transaction is being done, the transaction waits in this area before it gets validated by a block. So that is called the mempool. Somebody is looking at the mempool and knows what transaction is going to go through it. So then they use a bot to actually intercept that, you know, and then you see it's called front running because they intercept it and their transaction gets uh, validated quickly because they will give a higher mining fee to the validator. So this is this falls under the area of MEV. I do recommend that you guys have a look at it to understand what that is. And then you have timestamp dependence, which is, you know, manipulation of the by this is what the miner will do. You have the integer overflow and underflow, which is risky of manipulator. You have DOS denial of service attacks, which is also mentioned by in our previous talk. Uh, denial of service attacks, you know, can happen on anything. It doesn't matter if it's if it's the blockchain, if it's any system. You know, fundamentally, it's just overloading the server, overloading the RPCs with excessive amount of you know requests, blocking everybody else. Right. So that's what fundamentally it is. And then there's insufficient gas griefing. I haven't come across any particular postmortem that that actually references this. And forcibly sending ETH to contract. This does exist. Uh, I don't fully understand what that is, but and I haven't read any. But these are also being included. These SWC thing, which I've referenced here, this is the smart contract uh, of weakness classification registry. It works a lot like the CVE. If you're from the Web2 space, Web2 bug bounding space, where, you know the the common vulnerability uh, database. So SWC is like that for the uh, blockchains. Uh, the only caveat here is that SWC was maintained by consensus. But that the team or whoever was sort of responsible for it has, you know, sort of left and it's no longer being maintained. But that's something to look at. Then uh, very quickly about, you know, smart contract hacking 101. I have taken this uh, from this particular Twitter user, OBHEDA12. Uh, and this was also corroborated by a few other known auditors that this is basically a framework. As you can see, you have, you know, the threat modeling part, uh, you know, you do a bunch of stuff, a lot of testing. And then there's the informational gathering, which is the, the reconnaissance part, you know, in the whole steps of the uh, traditional penetration testing, the traditional uh, bug hunting methodology. This is just following that. It's just, you know, filling it up with Web3 stuff. So you have the information gathering, find out about what it is and the, read the papers and the blogs. You do some threat modeling, which in plain English means that you look at the code and then you test for it. How do you test it? You test it via hard hat a test you write the test or you use uh, another uh, a, a 
project called Foundry, for example, to write the test. So that's the threat modeling. Then you do the vulnerability ident identification. After you've done the threat modeling, you look at the code, you see the right calls, which, which can be attacked. Then you actually run the exploitation, you know, and then there's the post exploitation review. Now, another fundamental difference between Web 2 and Web 3 hacking. And the reason why, for example, the question is, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, the question is like the number of people in the web3 hacking space or penetration i don't like this word hacking by the way penetration penetration testing space is you know a lot less than web2 is that most of the bug hunters in the web2 space you know are highly tool dependent right you you, you use burp suite you use asset node you use you know all of these other well-known tools that that automates the whole process and it tells you exactly what to do and then you just sort of exploit it but why web3 is fundamentally different is you know speaking from a web2 perspective web3 hacking is technically exploit uh, exploit development or mal or malware development because in the web3 space you look at a vulnerable contract you see those functions which are exploitable but in order for you to exploit it you know using a tool will not help you will have to write the logic you will have to write an exploit contract to take advantage of it right so that's an interesting point to just keep in mind right right so what is slither slither basically this is a static code analyzer it's written completely in python which is uh, quite amazing and built over time it's a highly complex package that uses a bunch of libraries so it does automated vulnerability detection and it it, it gives you a whole lot of uh, optimization uh you know uh, notifications it helps you understand the code i primarily use it for you know uh, understanding like i said because i don't i i'm not a uh, an, a, an expert in solidity yet i use this tool quite often to understand all the function calls it gives me a good summary of what's going on and you know, stuff like that I, I anyway i i will make a demonstration of all that stuff now there are certain pros and cons right so the the major pro is that it gives you a granular analysis of any kind of contract. There are like a whole bunch of these things called detectors. Detectors are these, you know, uh, Python scripts which has been written by the people who made it. I forgot to mention that, uh, you know, it, uh, Slither was made by Trail of Bits. Trail of Bits are are leaders in the security space, right? So, so these guys have a lot of a lot of uh, experience in auditing all kinds of code. They've used all that knowledge and automated it, and they have made Slither, right? There's also another organization called Crytek. There's some relationship between Trail of Bits and Crytek. I'm not fully sure, so I'm not going to comment on it. So these guys have written these detectors. The detect is what detects, you know, all the faults, you know, in the actual code. Now, what are the cons? The, the major con is that, you know, this tool is definitely not for noobs. Because for the first time when you see its output, you'll be like, oh, my God, what is all this stuff? Right. This is for either a me, uh, intermediate or advanced level people who understand Solidity code and how the EVM or the Ethereum virtual machine works. The other thing noted by uh, prominent auditors is that it tends to be very noisy and tends to give lots of false positive, right? So that's some of the cons to, to uh, keep in mind, right? Okay, uh, and then the, so this is the thing which I had mentioned earlier. So what is the general advice about using, you know, tools in general? Now, if you're coming from the Web2 space, then you have this heavy reliance on all of these tools. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the one of the, a lot of the advice which I've like read in multiple blogs is that. So a lot of the advice which I've read uh, in the various blogs and through hanging out in discords is that, you know, uh, these tools, in addition to giving you false positives or leading you, <clears throat> leading you down the wrong path is that, you know, uh, the, the, the actual bugs, the high value bugs are not found with tools. Okay, it's found by manually auditing the contract. Manual auditing means like going line by line and then understanding what each function does and understands in the contract how the values are changing, right? So, so that's an important, important point to, to remember. Okay, what are the targets? So we'll be looking at, you know, two targets uh, for using the using this tool. The one is called the Spork DAO token. I've, I've, you, you can see on the screen. Uh, 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 one thing to note is that, you know, the way how Slither works, is it does not interact with the chain or the contract in any way. The way it works is it fetches the contract and it compiles it locally. This is why you need a hard hat, right, or truffle. 
So it'll compile the contract locally and run the analyzers. So this particular target, the Spark token, as you know, ETH Denver recently happened. And in ETH Denver, they had this Spark DAO. I don't know what that is really. But all I know is that I received in one of my wallets Spark tokens. I have never been to ETH Denver. I don't fully know what that is. I didn't register for it. So this is definitely a scam. It is an airdrop scam in my opinion right so we'll be having a look at spark DAO, which is you know it's actually deployed and we'll have a look at this other stuff which i put it all here uh and the other one which we'll be looking at is you know immunify which is uh, the the uh, bug bounty platform uh, and razor sec has some association with them they put out uh, community challenges which is like you know uh, every fortnight something like that. they put out a challenge uh, they give a bunch of vulnerable contracts. Uh, they, they tell they tell people to have at it uh, to, you know, improve yourself, right? Uh, so I'll be looking at one of their contracts also. Albeit, I have actually, you know, flattened the contract so I can use it. Okay, and then, okay, so that's that's enough talk about me. So let's, let's get into it, right? So I'm going to change my screen. <clears throat> okay, did, did you see my screen change? Hello? yeah your screen is visible uh, somebody okay great so so yeah. what is this so now what are we going to yeah sorry did somebody did somebody say something yeah i'm saying your screen is visible like github page is clearly uh, visible Love all it. good all good so uh, we are good to go Okay, so 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 what am I, what am I doing? So this is you know a test repository. I, I've I've made this and I'm going to demonstrate how to use Gitpod, right? So so before I do that, uh, I'll give you a quick overview. So Gitpod, right? So this is Gitpod. This is the actual uh, you know cloud development and uh, cloud development environment. Uh, you know it's it's pretty good as I mentioned earlier. You know if you look at their plans and pricing, their free tier is quite good. You get 50 hours per month. The way how Gitpod works is that it's working on Google Google Cloud's infrastructure. Every time you start an instance, it'll pull a Docker image. It's going to pull the Docker image and then it's going to sort of in, instantiate it and it's, and you're going to be able to use it. This particular Docker image has a bunch of packages within it. So I'm just going to bring that up, self-hosting. Um, uh, this is the pre-builds. Okay, so so and uh, where, where did I put it? Uh, here it is. So so when you start up uh, GitHub, what it does is that it's pulling a Docker image. So it's pulling Docker image from here. So the Docker image is a pre-built image that which which by default starts up, and it has you know all of this stuff. Actually, all of these packages are you know installed in it by default you see so you can do c closure go java and all of these things in fact you know it's it's quite versatile and you can it has a bunch of templates all you have to do is just run it and you can just start writing the code if you want to build a react application a python application uh, you know uh, uh, something in node or javascript you know it just runs right away right so the other thing i wanted to speak about are pre-builds what are pre-builds right pre-builds is is as i mentioned is you know uh, when you open up a project and you sort of run the workspace from it. Now, when you have your own instance and you keep, you know, installing as you're working and writing the code, you keep installing a lot of these uh, various packages and tools and blah, 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 this and that, right? Now, if you want to open a new instance up, you'll have to redo it. But you don't have to redo it because you can actually automate it by using the YAML file, as I mentioned. You can see the command structure. I'll, I'll, you'll have a look at, a look at an actual one. And, you know, it will reinstall it every time you you actually started, right? So so that's the other important aspect. Uh, okay, yeah, it's it's of, it's also built for collaboration. Collaboration is like the at the heart of, you know, Gitpod. So what that means is if you have a team of three people, you know, RazorSex, two guys, they want to build out, uh, you know, a DeFi game, for example. So both of them can be on, on Gitpod and they can both be working on their own separate branches. I mean, the entire workflow, which you on your machine, you can do it on the cloud. It's, it's that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at, right? That's what I'm actually getting at. Uh, and then other, okay, pre-builds, I, okay, startup tasks. So this is just the other thing uh, is, you know, as I said, you have the YAML and there's a bunch of things you can do. Let's look at an actual file. Yeah, okay, so, so here's an actual file. So what's happening? What's happening over here, right? So, you know, we declare this file right at the start. I'll show all that stuff. 
and then you know what it'll do that every time you start the instance also called a uh, called a snapshot it will run the python h3 h uh, http server and it'll open up that portal be running ready to go and you can put in your own you know custom shell scripts if you if you need to right and they have uh, these are you know open mode these are like various terminals terminals also it can it can open anyway i'll i'll, 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 I'll let me let me get to it so so we have so i have here is my repository i've already you know logged into my git pod now this is what it actually looks like so you have workspaces you have projects and you have settings so projects so the project is where the pre-building is occurring you know you you click on the new project and then you, know, you choose your stuff and what happens is that once you do it in this way uh, you know this project gets created and every time you push code to your repository the pre-build will build it automatically in the background. It'll keep rebuilding in the background so that we can open a new workspace, right? So I'll get to that. So how do we start? So right from the beginning, you've oh you've you've, uh, you've you've signed up with GitPod and you want to you want to you want to take it take it for a drive. What do you do? So you have your test repository and the way you actually start using it is you there are two ways. One way is that you know you come to the beginning of the address bar uh, in the be right before the https and you type gitpod.io slash uh, and the hash and you press enter now what's that going to do is that now gitpod has been activated because it's linked to your gitpod repository and you can see so what it has done right away is that it has pulled uh, a, uh, do a, a docker file with all of the packages that I mentioned and as you can see you are ready to go so here we have we have it's 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 familiar it's exactly like vs code it's got a great terminal uh, you know you understand just so Right, so you can see this is uh, at the moment running on a server somewhere. Okay, so it's in the United States, right? So anyway, so this is running on the Google Cloud infrastructure. I'll demonstrate that a little bit later. So we see over here. Uh, here we have opened up our instance. Uh, you know, this is the actual the repository. Well, where's my, one moment. Let me just reopen that. Right. So we have the repository now. This particular VS Code instance of within GitHub is now linked to this. So you know we can just quickly, uh, you know, set something. I just want to show how it works. So readme. md, and you know we're just going to write something repo test, repo test, and I'm just going to commit it and push it to the repository test. First time we just need to push the code. Okay, so it's pushed. Now when you come back, you can see over here, you know, it's 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 completely functional. There it is. I have pushed it directly from here. You can see it's quite fast, you know, nothing is happening locally. That's one benefit. So if you had like hundreds uh, hundreds of megabytes of files which are going you can you can see the you can see the commit over here there it is and you know here's a test repository right so so and uh, coming back over here as i said it's quite familiar it's exactly like vs code you have the entire gamut of the uh, of the uh, marketplace extensions you know you can install some of them already installed you can search for your own you can quickly just so the Solidity VS Code extension, you know, is often recommended if you want to. This is also installed by default. So you see it, it's, it's running completely like that, right? So so now when I turned, when I did the, the procedure to start up this instance, if you look at your Git pod now in the, in the workspaces here, it's running. This thing over here with the first line here, this is your actual workspace. Now, what happens is, for example, whenever I push something, you know, to my Git, uh, Git, uh, GitHub repository, it sort of keeps track of that via the commits. And for example, you know, I'm running this and I lose it. So I just closed it right, or I closed it right now, you know. But uh, so if I want to return back to what I'm doing, it's right over here. I just right click on this. I click on open 
and you know it's going to just pull the you know it's quite fast as you can see because i've not installed anything over here and it just pulled that docker repository and you know we're we're back to we are back to where we are at you know and we can you know continue our work now the other thing is that you know its benefit is that you can open multiple instances if you can see now if you say what's the big deal is then you can work on two or three branches at the same time of course that's not a recommended way of doing but for example if you're debugging uh, some code something that's already deployed you can use this in production you can open up multiple branches you understand you can push all of the code to it you know and of course you know you will do a pr request you will go through the pr you will go through the you will go through all of your pr requests and merge it as you want all right so now i am technically on not on the free tier but the free tier can let you do four of these all at the same time right four of these workspace instances all all, all of it at the same time right so you can see i have two of them running uh, running at the moment right so this is basically you know get pod in an in a nutshell the actual part the actual part of, of interest to you as i said this is the you know once i make the when i click on the new project i set up a new project uh, you know you can see why it, it, this exists is because now when when i start to actually uh, demonstrate slither slither requires me to install a lot of stuff in the background as I mentioned earlier. And so, you know, I don't have to keep doing that again and again. I'll just right click here, click on a new workspace and you'll see it will, it will, it will actually work. Uh, let me get back to my workbook to keep a track of what, uh, right. So you can see over here that the way you started up is like this. Uh, there is a bunch of awesome tutorials on their official GitHub pod youtube i highly recommend that you check it out so we went through all of this so we'll now we'll get to the actual slither part and i'm going to close this instance i'm going to close this instance okay here we have it running so all i did was in my workspace i have i have it i have it prepared you can see here unchained 2022 i've prepared this for this particular uh, uh, conference talk and you know i'm just i just right click on it and right click on this and click on open and then you know it's 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 right over here ready for me to uh, use so so here we have the actual now it's installed uh i have slither running over here so let's 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 uh, dive right into it about slither in general and it's you know quick functionality so let's you know first let's see about you know all the stuff that slither can do so of course you know we can have a look at the repo but you know this is more hands-on so you get to see what's happening you can see it can do a lot of things over here uh, its syntax is very simple all you have to do is you know you write the command you write the target and you put the flags the target can be as a local soul file which i'll show you in a moment it can be an entire directory this is your npx hard hat uh you know project which you're working on on multiple contracts you know you just run slither you give the project the directory and it'll work another good thing is that it fetches contracts directly from the uh, uh from you know from the network it is deployed to right it works with a bunch of networks you can see the main net robson cohen ring b all of them majority even bsc it works and also you know on the l2 solutions are you know rb and i think there's optimism is there uh, no, op optimism is not there. So it works with 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 with, uh, with RB. You know, RB is is Ar Ar Arbitrum, which is the Ethereum L2 scaling machine, right? And then there's a bunch of interesting flags. What is of interest is you know you can suppress the compilation via Truffle. You know, you understand as I said, you can you know the way it functions is that it fetches the contract, it compiles it locally, and then runs the analysis, right? Uh, you can suppress that you know you can do a bunch of stuff over here uh, there's some ether scan options you know if you only want to look at the source code if you only want to look at the byte code the byte code is you know when you have a solidity file it goes to the compiler it gets into byte code and that's how the then that's how and then it gets you know deployed onto the chain right so and here are the you know if you have a key for the specific uh, network you can use that and call it um and okay so the the, the the detectors the detectors is you know what is of interest it lets you sort of you know 
uh, you can choose what you want to actually find in your code. So I'm going to run the default that does all of this. You can see it looks for delegate calls. You can look only for the compiler issues, if there's any functional problems, if there are delegate call loops, you know, a bunch of other stuff like re-entrancy re stuff, you know, so you can see all of this can be done. And we can also list it. I will also run that and show you. Uh, and what else is that? Oh, printers, printers. So the printers are an important aspect for, you know, using this particular tool. So what are the printers? The printers puts up the analysis in, in, a, in such a way that it will be digestible to you, right? Instead of just lines and lines of complicated stuff, which I'm going to show you, you know, it actually will, will do that. And it also has this another interesting thing called the triage mode. I haven't worked with what this is, but it also it spits out a JSON file with all of its. It's I I, I imagine it somehow you know works. In, it sort of works into the uh, triaging uh, triaging pipeline, right? Uh, Adrian Hedman would would know more about this than me. Okay, so so let let let's get into it. So first, I am going to let's go to my presentation. Um, what I'm doing is I'm looking for the our target so let me look at the where is it dependencies uh, targets right okay so the spark the spark token so what we're going to do is we're going to first have a look at you know what it looks like uh, deployed on the po on the polygon chain so here we have the spark token this is the spark token you know this this is polygon scan and you can see the bunch of transactions which are happening, all zero transactions. These might be automated. I don't know. You can see that it's it's not very popular at the moment. As I said, this is very peculiar. It just sort of showed up in people's wallets all of a sudden, right? So, you know, and then, like I said, it sort of raise, raises, raises my, my, my eyebrow. So, okay, so here we have, so here we have the actual uh, contract. So let's copy the contract we'll get back to here you know if everything is properly installed you know we will run the uh, analysis oh sorry one moment that one is not the actual tokens Okay, so uh, so the the main contract is actually on the Ethereum chain, right? So the main contract is on the Ethereum chain. Oh, this is my mistake. It's also on the Polygon chain, but the main contract is on on the on the Ethereum chain. So in the Ethereum chain, you can see that this tick mark means that it's it's a it's a valid contract, right? And you know, if you have a quick look, you can see the contract source. It's running on zero point eight point zero. There's nothing out of the ordinary over there. Uh, so we are going to run the analysis. So I just ran the analysis over here, as you can see. Now it has spit out a bunch of stuff. Right? I'll, 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 I'll run that again one more time, just for brevity. Okay, so now this is the output of Slither. Slither tells you a bunch of stuff. Like it's quite detailed. It gives you color-coded information. It gives you color-coded information about its findings. So as you can see now, the yellow part of it is these are areas which you have to sort of pay attention to. I don't fully understand each one of these lines, but what I do understand is that, you know, it tells you there's an access control issue over here and, uh, it, and it gives you the actual line numbers of where the problem is. Uh, there's an there's a access control, another issue with revoke role over here. There's uh, another one over here called the setup role. So it's something related to access or the access control is an issue. Again, don't forget that you know this can be noisy. Like the advice which I have got is once we actually have this particular tool and we get these, uh, get this output, we have to actually go through them line by line and try to understand you know whether it's 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 of interest or not. And the stuff in green is informational. Okay, it's telling you that you know there's this bunch of things. Uh, you know, it's they saying that you know this particular thing has never been issued, uh, never been used. Like why, why put uh, you know uh, uh, functions or code which is never being used? So that's that's interesting thing over there. I tell you about the type of compilers which this thing is working with. That is of interest. 
then it also tells gives you some advice that you know the the uh, this particular symbol should not, should not be used uh, a you know in this particular instance which is in in this particular line 192 to 194 uh, you know, so it gives you. So now this information seems a little bit garbled, right? So let's 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 look at the printers. The printers. Look at one of the printers. Look at the uh, syntax for the list printers. So we're going to see the printer. The printers are the stuff which is you know humanly readable. So let's look at the printers which exists sorry syntax error list and printer right so these are all of the stuff which is humanly readable of interest to us is let's look at the contract summary so i slither and uh, the syntax is hyphen hyphen uh, print and we type it so it's hyphen hyphen print and we're going to do the human summary of the code so now it's going to fetch it uh, what happens is it has fetched the contract and it has you know compiled it locally because hard hat is there and you know it, it it's telling you some interesting facts here there's some optimization issues that's not a big deal anything in green and yellow is is for, is for interest nothing which is high you can see so it tells us you know there's a bunch of uh, innumerable uh, strings innumerable set you have like a bunch of functions uh, what are the erc's which it's calling the erc20 info the git talks about a race con condition is it a complex code or not mm -hmm. So let, let's look at some more printers of interest. Um, okay, we'll look at the function summary. This is also, I will just press up. So we'll look at the function summary. So the function summary, it will take any sort of a, a contract and then it will give you a function, a summary of all the functions that have been called or used in, the, uh, in that particular contract function summary. yeah so you know it's 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 quite detailed it's quite detailed uh you know i have to make a make your life simpler i have done this in advance and put it in a text file which can be more easily readable so in the function summary just so this is what the function summary will actually look like so you have it tells you it is the which is the contract which has been used and then you know if there's you know these are javascript type of stuff with any in inheritance involved if, what are the contract variables uh, tells you you know all of the major functions what is the visibility uh, you know if there are any modifiers you know as it was mentioned in our first talk that how a lack of use of the modifiers you know makes it e makes it anybody makes it easy for anybody to to call that function in an unintended way right so that's a very important thing. it gives you some more information whether it's read or write or whether it's an internal call whether it's an external call if there's some more stuff it'll come up over here which are the modifiers which is visible or not these are like uh, summaries uh you know and then these are again it's it does multiple uh, uh how should i say cycles of analysis and then gives you you know similar kinds of inf information what are the function visibility stuff like that um okay so this is another some more detail you can see it, it's quite detailed you know it's 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 a lot to digest to understand but it, it the good thing is it gives you a good overview of from an auditing perspective what to look at you know there are functions of particular interest right so i'm, I'm just going through it uh, you know so so that 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 is the a function summary now what else what else can we look at is of interest i'm very i i know there are 15 minutes left for my talk so we let's look at some more anything one more of this and then we'll look at the community challenge so i can show you that it does indeed you know detect stuff right okay so function summary we looked at the human summary uh let's look at the function ID. So,
Okay, so this is you know a little bit more condensed way. You know, it 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 it, it this will tell you that particular token or that particular contract. What are all the functions? which are being called right? and it assigns an id to it so when you have all of these functions then you can quickly you can quickly reference it and see you know which one is of interest to you or are aware that that particular function is often prone to uh, vulnerabilities and it's often overlooked you know from an auditing perspective right so that's that's for the uh, contract which has been already deployed so let's 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 look at uh, you know the immunify community challenge which was there so 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 here's the challenge now the actual code looks like this which was uh immunified challenge council okay so so this is the actual vulnerable code which was written by one of the members for the analysis you know it's a staking contract i know that because of this particular declaration here so it's a staking contract and you know uh, uh, you can see there here's the address staker so this is a straight in, and this is a vulnerable piece of contract and our exercise was to solve it i did not solve it yet right i'm still looking into it now what is of interest what i'm trying to get at is that you know when you download the contract you know via wget function or whatever function and try to run slither on it locally slither is going to give you a bunch of errors because of you know it'll keep saying this is not found that is not found especially these open zeppelin contracts right so in order for it to there's a process called flattening so when you download a contract uh, you know for uh, any particular analysis you have to flatten the contract so what that means that it will sort of uh, add all of these external contracts you know what is the code which it actually uses it's going to put it into the main contract so a flattened contract so you just have a look at the difference over here from this particular lines one to seven when we flatten the contract you can see now it becomes a lot bigger and what's going on is that from each one of the open zeppelin calls it is calling the actual function within them right so now it is all locally within this contract so it has also increased in the total number of lines and now when it is in this flattened state mm -hmm. we can run slither on it so slither and i had named it uh, challenge flat and see we and here's the output and you can see that in it indeed found now an error here so here is it says in red is that there is a re-entry problem with this particular contract now i don't know if that is true or false but this is what it's saying there and like i said the advice i was given was that once you get this output we have to you know take a look take a look at it cl closely so it's saying that there's a re-entrancy problem uh you know in these particular 683 to 689 it's telling us it's over there uh, here is the call which is the source of the problem the token safe transfer message sender now i guess you know this is the part which i have to do my own understanding and auditing on whether if this really is the case so my point is that it it, it does work now in reference to this uh, you know, Slither actually has been able to find, you know, uh, valid bugs. So I'm now I, what I've done is I have gone into the Critic, uh, Crytek Slither's original repository, and within them it is showing you all of the trophies. Trophies means that things it has worked. So Slither was was able to correctly show that there was this problem with this particular contract. More recently. Uh, we are host, so there was this thing called hold my beer on the token. There was definitely a re-entrancy there. You can see it's detected here again. Lack of a uh, value check again here and here. So you can see that it actually does work, right? Uh, but of course, you know, once we once we get our uh, complicated output, then we have to sort of run our own, or run our own analysis, write some tests in 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 hard hat to actually you know exploit it right exploit this exploit this particular vulnerability okay so let me get back to my this thing have i covered everything let's see um yeah so 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 that's you know slither is uh generally all of its you know functionality which is of interest like i said what is important to you is you know you can run it locally right and you can look at its parameters so its printers tells you a lot of interesting info information now it also does you know it shows you the the cfd which is the control flow uh, graph of each particular function 
So the way it fire does that it's quite detailed, you know. And once I'm not going to run this command right now. I've done it in the you know prior to because it spits out a bunch of uh, dot files, you know. So let, let's let's have a look at the report. Call so it you know these are the call graphs for one particular token. So this is in a dot format. So to see the dot format, you know, mm -hmm. is it's a diagram. So let me bring that up. Okay, so so it's it's a dot diagram. We're going to use another uh, online tool called Plant Text. Plant Text is you know if you guys know about Plant UML, Plant UML is a UML diagramming software. So it, they have, this is an online compiler also. So this particular code which has uh, which it has given, which is you know the uh, it's a dot file code. It helps you see diagrammatically what are all the calls that are occurring in that particular. Uh, particular function right so if i run this i'm going to run it diagraph name okay so so here it is so here is the 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 you know a diagram so this is the control flow graph of that particular contract you know of its specific function so it's telling you diagrammatically that you have an erc20 call and it is possible this is the function before token it tells you in what way it's functioning it's telling you oh, how all the access control stuff is working as a separate grant role now you know it, it from a diagrammatic perspective this looks like a lot of gibberish and, and spaghetti but you know this is the thought process behind the actual writing of that particular contract right so this is what the cfg actually looks like you know and you know it's quite detailed it's it's very you know it's quite detailed you know you can have a look and what i would use this for is when i'm you know learning about the particular contract if if i don't understand how two particular functions that are being called in two separate locations what is the relationship and how are they actually functioning with each other right so instead of you know drawing it out with my hand or you know imagining it i would definitely use a cfg right so that that's the control flow diagram uh what else all interest to see I showed that. Okay, so so those are the those are the important things about Slither. So you know, an important thing you guys have to keep in mind about uh, Slither in general is that this this piece of advice that you know it is a high noise static analyzer. That it, its output needs to be critically analyzed. And then once you what would in my opinion the best approach is that to use this particular tool, which by the way they are. A whole sea of tools. Oh, and as a as a as a tangent to what I'm saying, if you can still see my screen, you can also have a look at this excellent website which I found. Uh, you know, and what it is is that it is a compilation, a curated repository of Web3 stuff. Right? It's got like a bunch of tools. You can search for it. Uh, you know, and you know, there's one ones and videos. Um, the reason why I'm showing you this is it's related to what I'm talking is that, you know, there are a bunch of tools that does the same thing in terms of an analyzer. You know, there's a there's a bunch of tools that does the does this analysis and Slither is not the only one is one amongst many. Right. So so that is that. Uh, okay, I think I've covered most of it. Uh, that's it. That's all. That's enough talking from me. And, you know, if you guys have any more, I still got five minutes left. You know, if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to talk, to ask them. And I will definitely, uh, you know, uh, uh, answer them to the best of my technical ability. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to hand over the mic back to the organizers. Hello? Yeah, hello. Yes. <coughs> hey, Mohammed. I like it. It was a very nice session. I was <coughs> actually looking forward to follow this because I also wanted to do the same uh, <laughs> slither so that it, 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 like, it becomes handy for me, right? So, yes, Lovely. it's very much needed. 
and yes like i wanted to ask uh, uh according to the perspective of a uh user or you can say a person just getting uh, his head around the uh, slither right so yeah. what would be uh your uh suggestion uh to him or her like kind of a approach that a person should follow uh while taking uh, data from slither right uh like uh starting with printers or making uh, uh graphs uh, and uh, continuing with the the issues and all like how to approach that data uh from a slither sure okay so so i will give you a quick rundown from the top to bottom mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. first of all you need to you know find a contract you find a contract you want to actually look at right so what i recommend is going through immunify you know they're not paying me to say this all right guys i'm just saying that go to the immunify yeah. <laughs> immunify bounty program you know there's tons of money to be made if you can crack one of them so you find the contract that you want secondly you can do one of two things you can either download the contract you know locally uh, to your hard drive and flatten it like i said uh, and then run the analysis or you could use slither to actually run it from the uh, you know from the deployed chain itself now once you get this information as i said th an important point is that you need to have some understanding of solidity at least in general right maybe not so deep but in general so that the output that you get are excellent pointers for you to actually investigate for example i would look at i would run slither i would run the printer i'd look at the function id function id it'll give you it'll spit out like 100 functions then you have to go through the painful process i know it sounds painful but making all that money is 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 not easy right and the people who build these contracts are highly paid people with huge teams who spend most of their life most of their time every day building this so you have to look at each one of those contracts find out what they do or the an easier way is look at the post mortems which have been given by you know uh, by uh, the, in the in the immunify uh, medium blog they have a bunch of them you can go through them see which function calls were the source of the problem right and then you can then uh, see if those functions exist in the output and then look at the code surrounding it and understand the logic right now i don't understand like i said i'm learning slither myself you know I'll be at a little bit rapid space because I want to also, you know, uh, find a bug here, you know, eventually. So uh, to understand the, the the code logic that goes behind that particular function, and definitely uh, the other thing which I can recommend, I highly recommend, which I'm also going to do and am doing, is to attend to is to uh, to actually. Uh, you know, attempt the CTFs. There's some excellent CTFs called Ethernaut, and like there's a bunch of them. You can see, you can uh, just just Google it and find like a bunch of them, or you can go to that website which I mentioned, web web3sec.com, and you go to the CTFs. The CTFs tells you in, in what manner to look at the function, in what manner to see how it's particularly exploited now as i said once you get all of the output you see a lot of red don't get too excited because it's a high it's a high it's a high noise uh it's a high noise output and then you have to sort of reaffirm them you have to sort of verify them using other tools or if you are very good at reading the code and at building logic to actually use that uh, logic to you know find out the source of the problem hopefully i have answered the question yes yes it does and yes uh, uh, a lot of information and a wonderful tutorial that has been covered by you uh, really been great can can you share that uh, site link with us uh, the web3 okay site sure it, it is w3bs3c i am typing it out in the uh, yes in, in the private the... chat you can send it here and we can just forward it out okay i am going to do that right now it is Web three sec dot com. Got it. Right. And uh, uh, yes, and uh, to the viewers, uh, the slides will be shared as well uh, after the end of the event. And <clears throat> any of the resources uh, that are linked uh, to this tutorial or uh, anything like that uh, will be uh, shared as well. I will just communicate with uh, Muhammad and uh, we'll sure. take down all the notes and uh, we'll share it with you guys. 
And once again, I uh, just wanted to thank you for coming down to Unchained. It was great. And yes, uh, hopefully many of the guys who are actually looking forward to uh, come into the Web3 security, uh, it would have helped them because... Uh, I, 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 I definitely hope so. <laughs> right, yes. Because, like, yes, it 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 it, it keeps the task very handy uh, for for all the users to not having your own machine and uh, just keep the things in the cloud. Yeah. Keep your uh, uh, security task. Uh, do uh, uh, you can also do that with the branches as well that you pointed out. Yep. Right? So all these things that are like that will help a lot. So yeah, with that, I uh, would like to thank you and. Hope to see you soon uh, in our next event. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm going to go offline now. Yeah, for sure. And bye-bye, Muhammad. Have a great day.